So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the eye. So the eye is obviously very important. So the first thing we're going to do is just talk about some basic eye anatomy. So you can take a look over here. You can see um, that you have the the outer uh, wall of the eye is made up of the sclera, and the sclera is the whites of your eye. Um, then you have the cornea, which is the transparent layer, and that lies over the iris and the pupil. The junction of these two areas is called the limbus. That'll come up a little bit later, and you'll see the importance of that. Um, then you also have the conjunctiva. This is the mucous membrane, and this lines the inner lid as well as the sclera. And then you have the ciliary body, and the ciliary body is, um, takes care of accommodation, which is your lens shape, as well as aqueous humor, production, resorption. Okay, so now we'll talk about the components of the eye exam. So what would you say is one of the most important things that you need to document on every eye exam in your chart? Visual acuity, exactly. So visual acuity, we say, is the vital sign of the eye. So you can see that you have the Snellen chart over there. Um, so oftentimes you can order it or ask for it, and they'll do it for you. Or if a patient's not mobile, then you can use an app on your phone, and that can, it usually tells you to stand a certain amount of feet away from the patient, and then you can also do your own exam that way, which can be easier. So you want to make sure to do a good external exam. Look for symmetry. Look at the lids. Um, you want to make sure that you uh, note you know, that the lashes are all intact, that there are no lacerations there. Um, you want to note that extraocular movement is also intact. And then take a good look at the pupil. You want to make sure that the pupil is not irregular and it's not peaked. If it's irregular and peaked, what may that indicate to you? Globe rupture. Right? If you have a globe rupture, sometimes you'll see that, and so it's important to note that. Um, you can also take a look for a relative afferent pupillary defect, which may indicate that there's an optic nerve injury, so it's really important to note. Okay, so then you want to look at the anterior segment of the eye. So here you're going to look at the conjunctiva. You're going to see is there a conjunctival hemorrhage? Um, can you see chemosis? Look at the cornea. See if you can see if there's an obvious abrasion. You'll for further look into this using a Woods lamp exam and some fluorescein. Now you want to check the anterior chamber. So the anterior chamber, you can be, take some information. You can see if there's a hyphema or a hypopion, um, but you really want to do a slit lamp exam. So there is a 24-minute video, and I did not include it in this slide here, so you guys can watch it at your leisure. Um, but this is really important. How many of you guys have a slit lamp exam at your facility? Okay, so it's really, really important to get familiar with it because it's considered the gold standard, so you want to make sure that you do know how to use it. Also want to look at the retina and the optic nerve. Um, panoptic, I don't know if you guys have a panoptic in your facility. It's really hard, unless you're doing a good dilated exam, it's hard to see, to do the fundoscopic exam in the ED and get a good look. But if you have a panoptic, that is the best way, and you can really assess for things like papilledema and really get some more information about that. Okay, so you want to measure the intraocular pressure. So normal intraocular pressure, so it's 8 to 21. I just remember it's about 10 to 20. If you can remember it's 10 to 20, that'll help guide you in that. And you want to use a ton of pen. But you really want to remember, if there is an open globe injury, you want to avoid this step. So don't do that. Okay, and then we talked about the fluorescein staining. You can use the woods lamp to look for abrasion, ulceration. Okay, and then you want to check visual fields as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about eye basics. So as you guys all said, the first thing that we're going to do is visual acuity, and you want to make sure that you check it in both eyes and together. Um, if a patient comes in with a chemical exposure, just skip this step, because the important thing you really want to do is irrigate the eye properly. So if a patient has their glasses, you want to make sure and have them use their glasses. If they don't, you can do a pinhole visual acuity. And the pinhole visual acuity is very helpful. It corrects for refractive defect. And if you ever want to know what it does, just take off your glasses if you have it. And you can kind of make a little pin here and just look through it, and you can see how your vision improves. And that's the basic concept with that. Um, so now we'll talk a little bit about about the chemical exposure to the eye. So what do you guys use when you're assessing for chemical exposure? What, what tool do you have that can help guide you in terms of how well you're doing with irrigation? Exactly, pH paper, right. So you can use pH paper, and you can note it initially, and then when you irrigate, that'll tell you how well you're doing and how much more you want to, um, to continue to irrigate. And you really want to irrigate until you normalize their pressure.
I mean, I'm sorry, their pH. So you want to make sure that their pH is about 7 to 7.4 in that respect. And a very useful uh, thing to do is to use a topical anesthetic. Chemical exposures can be very painful, so you want to make sure to do that. You can also evert the eye just to make sure that there's any particulates, uh, depending on the exposure, that you clean them out. So for prolonged exposure, you can use a Morgan lens. Again, make sure you use the topical anesthetic for that. Um, also, which is very helpful because I had a recent pediatric patient with a chemical exposure, and um, what we had is we had a liter bag set up with some IV tubing, and we uh, connected a little angiocath, obviously without the needle, and um, we just had mom sit there with him in her lap, and she just irrigated the eye. And so it was really easy. There wasn't fighting. We didn't have to hold down um, the patient. So that can be very helpful too. And then again, use your pH paper to regularly check it. You can do 500, recheck it, do a liter. I usually do at least a liter. And if after a liter you haven't normalized, just keep going. Okay, so I foreign bodies. So again, topical anesthetic. You could probably use that for all things relating to the eye with discomfort, and that can sometimes help relieve um, pain for patients. And you want to use the fluorescein strip. Some people put the fluorescein strip directly in the eye. I tend to take a, um, like a saline flush or one of the little saline uh, uh, tubes, and I just kind of hold it up and get the fluorescein in there, and then I just drop it in the patient's eye. And then you want to take a look with your Woods lamp exam or slit lamp exam, and you can take a look and see. So if you see a vertical, vertical um, abrasions like that, what does that make you think of? Right, that there could be a foreign body that's stuck on the lid, right? Because then every time they're blinking, it's basically just scraping it. It's as if like, if you have a windshield wiper, and this may or may not have happened to me, um, if you have a windshield wiper and the blade falls out, and then it's just basically scraping your windshield back and forth, that is the concept of that. Okay, so, if you have a metal foreign body, that can give you a rust ring. It's very important to remove that because that can um, stain the cornea. And you, this really wants to be uh, done by uh, an ophthalmologist, subspecialist who's been trained to do that. Um, also, if they have drilling injuries, if you have a mechanic, um, you can use an x-ray to further assess to see if there's any metal foreign bodies in the eye. Early follow-up is very important. So corneal abrasion, so this is usually by being scratched or poked in the eye. Um, you can use a slit lamp exam to take a look. Topical antibiotics are often prescribed. You want to make sure that you tell your patients not to wear any contact lenses and to make sure that they only wear their glasses. And cycloplegics are not really helpful in this situation, so we don't recommend them. Patches. I don't know if anybody's still using patches, um, but patches are also not helpful. In fact, there was a meta-analysis that took a look at this, and they looked at at least 17 trials, and in seven of them, they found that the rates of healing did not improve with a patch, and as well as um, did not decrease pain. So not really helpful. Okay. So you want to make sure that you look for abrasions associated with contact lenses. Make sure to look for ulcerations. Um, and what you want to do is when you cover them with antibiotics, you want to make sure to cover for pseudomonas. So what do you guys typically use for your contact lens wearers? Cipro, exactly. That's, that's very easy. OK. And what do you guys think? Tetanus? Yes or no? Yes. I mean, is there ever a time where you're like, no, tetanus, no, no? Right? Yes, tetanus. Okay. All right, blunt eye injury. So blunt eye injury, you want to make sure that you take a really good look, and you can see if they have uh, a hyphema, which you can take a look in the picture up here. And um, that's usually, it's blood in the anterior chamber, and it sits behind the lens and in front of the iris. And you can take a look also for microhyphemas. This would be done with a slit lamp exam, and this can be indicative of a, an un, differ, you know, underlying injury that you want to further evaluate. For these patients, you want to consult ophthalmology. Okay, so let's talk about viral conjunctivitis. So this is kind of bread and butter for us, right? We see conjunctivitis all the time. Um, so the question is, how do we differentiate viral from bacterial? Sometimes it's challenging. Sometimes it's more difficult. Um, with viral, they can tend to get a gritty feeling in their eye. Um, they typically do not have photophobia. Their vision is normal and should be normal. Um, the redness here, you can take a look, and the redness is more peripheral. And this will be compared to other pathology that we'll take a look that can help you distinguish um, whether it can be just a basic viral conjunctivitis or something else. Um, it's typically a watery discharge, and it will usually last about four to seven days. 
Schools often ban it. This is basically like a common cold of the eye that can be transmitted as easily. And slit lamp exam is advised, um, but no specific treatment is necessary. Okay, so bacterial conjunctivitis. So the bacterial conjunctivitis, your patient may come in complaining, you know, that they woke up in the morning and the eye was matted shut and they had to wash it to get all the gunk out. And you take a look and they've got this purulent mess there. Um, this is the common pathogens are usually staph, strep, H. flu, Moraxella. Um, more commonly in adults, you will see staph. Okay, so let's say you have a patient that's coming in with genital discharge and conjunctivitis. What might you guys want to think about? Yes, exactly. You want to think about an STD. So, I mean, you know, just keep that in the back of the mind because that can also sometimes be a factor. Um, topical antibiotics are recommended. For children, ointments are often better. So I only prescribe ointments for children because otherwise you're trying to get the drop in. Some of it stays in, some of it doesn't. With the ointment, you can put a line in there and it'll, and it'll stick. Okay, so now we'll talk about uveitis and iritis. So the uvea... Um, it takes, it, the uvea is made up of the choroid, the ciliary body, and the iris. The iris is the anterior part, and so that is why iritis is also referred to as anterior uveitis. Um, now, a key thing to distinguish this, um, because sometimes it can be a little challenging, you're like, is this iritis or conjunctivitis, or, you know, could there be an abrasion there? So if you put topical um, anesthetic on their eye, that does not take away the pain. So I tend to find that very useful, right? Because you do it and you're like, are you feeling better? And the patient's like, oh, yeah, it's great. Right? And you're like, okay, this is probably corneal. But if you put it and it's not helping, then you're worried that it's something a little bit deeper there. Um, so the other thing to look at, so we talked about the limbus, right? The limbus, that was the junction between the cornea and the sclera. So if you take a look at the picture over there, you can see that there's some heightened erythema around that area. And that should raise your suspicion for iritis. Okay, and again, you want to do a slit lamp exam. What are you guys looking for in your slit lamp exam? This is like the one thing that they always say, look for the slit lamp. Cell and flare, right? They're always like, cell and flare, look for cell and flare. Well, this you can see in the anterior chamber, and um, that's why you want to make sure to do that. And make sure to also consult an ophthalmologist for this, because this can cause blindness, so it's really important that you make this diagnosis and you refer them appropriately. You also want to make it clear to the patient that uveitis, it's usually caused by an underlying, underlying condition. So, you know, it, there could be something else. In fact, about 40% are caused by um, immune, like systemic immune-mediated diseases, like lupus or um, Kawasaki's, sarcoid. So that's why you want to make sure that you tell them that this is what it is. They will need to be further evaluated for these other entities. Infections can also cause this. You can see this in things like HSV, CMV, um, you can see it in coxie, toxo, um, tuberculosis, I mean, you name it, Zika, syphilis, so many things can cause this. So it's really important you instruct them that they need to further evaluate this. Okay, and then you want to look for other causes of the eye, redness of the eye. You want to make sure that you ask very specific questions. Every patient that has an eye complaint, make sure that you ask them if they're wearing contact lenses, because that can help guide what you're looking for, but also guide your treatment. And um, you also, if you're not sure, like if you know exactly what this is and how to treat it, that's fine. But if you're not sure, consider discussing it with the subspecialist um, or the ophthalmologist or consider um, referring them for further evaluation as well. And other examples are things like UV keratitis. So this you'll see in patients who are welding. Um, because if you weld, if you, get a, if you get a welder that comes in, you know, and they are, are complaining of pain in their eye, you know, ask them, were you wearing your helmet? And they'll be like, no, I just had to weld a little thing, so I didn't bother putting it up. And then you can get that. Snowboarders can also get this, or skiers from the reflection of the sun in the snow. So that's something to think about there. And then allergic conjunctivitis, they can come in with itching. If you look at the underlid, um, then you can see that there's a cobblestone appearance to that, and you can take a look at that in the picture. Okay. So now, a hordeolum, that's just a fancy way of saying sty. Um, you get a little purulent inflammation of the lid. You basically treat this with warm compresses. There's little evidence for antibiotics in this situation. Um, Clasian, that's a cyst in the lid. It's typically painless. Um, you could try warm compresses, but these will often need to be referred to ophthalmology. They could do steroid injections, um, or they can do an IND as well.
Okay, pinguiculum and a pterygium. Say that three times fast. Um, <laughs> so this is just some thickened connective tissue. It's kind of wedge-shaped on the eye. You can see it in the pictures there. You can get it medial or lateral. Um, it can be associated with chronic sun exposure. And a pinguiculum, that's just localized to the conjunctiva, so that's more lateral. Um, a pterygium, that is when it extends onto the cornea. And the treatment is basically uh, lubrication and then refer to ophthalmology. Okay, so dacrocystitis and dacroadenitis. So dacrocystitis um, and adenitis, this is just inflammation um, and, uh, or infection of the tear duct and the lacrimal ducts. So you can get painful, red, swollen area right up by the inner lid. Sometimes if you express a little bit, you can express some purulence from that area. Um, treatment is oral antibiotics. And um, it's, usually it's usually caused by um, common skin infections as well or skin pathogens. Okay, so the next thing to talk about, and this is really important, it's orbital versus periorbital cellulitis. Now we see this all the time, right? And with uh, periorbital cellulitis, it's great, right? You can treat them with antibiotics, you can discharge them, you can reassure them, have them follow up, but orbital cellulitis can be life-threatening and can cause blindness and can cause death. And so this is a diagnosis you cannot miss. So it is so important to be able to differentiate um, how to tell between the two. And lucky for you, I will tell you how to do that. So that's good. Okay, so with um, preceptal or periorbital cellulitis, um, this is an infection of the anterior portion of the eyelid. Orbital cellulitis looks more at the fat, the orbital contents, which includes the fat and the muscle. Okay, and um, let's first talk about periorbital cellulitis. Okay, so this is, again, we said it was anterior to the orbital septum. This is more common, and it's usually caused by the um, skin flora. So you'll see staph, strep, community-acquired MRSA is also increasing, so you want to make sure to cover for that. You can get some local trauma that can cause it. This could be like an insect bite or a scratch, a little foreign body. Um, sinusitis, more orbital, but it's certainly possible. But you, if that's the case, you want to make sure you're really documenting well and very confident that it's not orbital cellulitis. So clinical presentation. Okay, so you can get, you can get a little pain in the area, um, but you get eyelid swelling, you get erythema. In terms of if you just look at a person, it is not that easy to tell the difference between periorbital and orbital cellulitis. The treatment here is um, usually you can do clindamycin or you can do um, Bactrim plus another agent like cephalosporin. Okay, so now orbital cellulitis. So again, we said that you can um, see this from para, um, para, uh, paranasal sinuses. Um, clinical presentation here, again, it will look very similar. You will get per periorbital swelling, erythema. But the key distinction between the two is you will get pain with extraocular movements. If you have a patient that comes in who has, you know, a red, puffy, swollen eye um, and, and surrounding area, but they're like, oh, they don't want to move their eye. They're like, Doc, I, I just, you know, I just, I can't move my eye. It's really painful. You, this, this should ring a bell in your head and say, I need to evaluate for orbital cellulitis and make sure that it is not the case. In these patients, you must obtain imaging. So you want to get either a CT with contrast or an MRI of the orbit. You want to consult ophthalmology for this. Um, the other thing is, if you don't, if the, you miss this, the problem is it can lead to um, subperiosteal um, infections. You can get brain abscesses, sepsis, death, really bad. And this patient should be admitted and given IV antibiotics, IV vanco, um, you know, plus something like a ceftriaxone or, or zosin, broad spectrum antibiotic coverage is important. And again, ophthalmology con uh, consultation. All right, now we'll just take it down a notch. So subconjunctival hemorrhage, we see it all the time. In fact, I just had a patient that was transferred from urgent care um, that wanted to transfer them by ambulance for a subconjunctival hemorrhage, and I was able to offer the patient some reassurance. The majority of these cases are idiopathic. They don't really know why it happens. You can get them from Valsalva, coughing, you know, any kind of um, increased in pressure in that sense. Pa you know, patients will always ask, is it because my blood pressure is, you know, 200 right now? 
And, you know, yes and no. Like, no, it's not because your blood pressure right now is this one number that's elevated, but systemic hypertension does have mass, uh, microvascular changes um, in vessels, including the conjunctival vessels, right? So this can pre uh, predispose you to subarachnoid hemorrhage. I'm sorry, subconjunctival hemorrhage. And um, totally different lecture, totally different lecture. <laughs> Okay, but if these patients come in with recurrent or persistent subconjunctival hemorrhage, um, you do want to work them up, again, looking for systemic hypertension or make sure they don't have a bleeding disorder or some kind of um, ocular malignancy. Okay, now we're going to finish up with acute angle closure glaucoma. So this, again, is an ocular emergency, right? And what happens is you can get um, a rapid increase in intraocular pressure. Um, so you know, again, normal range about eight, uh, 10 to 20. And if it's greater than 30, then you risk uh, ischemic damage to the optic nerve. So you wanna make sure that you recognize this and then you treat it accordingly. The classic presentation is a mid-size, poorly reactive pupil with some corneal clouding. And um, patients can complain of decreased vision, they can see halos, they can get headaches, vomiting, sometimes some abdominal discomfort, um, nausea. You can get some conjunctival erythema as well. And these patients need emergent intervention, right? You really need to get on these very quickly. So the treatment is to um, reversal and uh, decrease the intraocular pressure. So you can use a beta blocker, which helps decrease the aqueous uh, humor production. You can use a cholinergic, which causes pupillary constriction, which just helps with the outflow track of aqueous humor. Um, you can use an alpha adrenergic, which also helps reduce the production. And um, you can use acetazolamide, which is a 500 milligram IV dose that can also help. And these patients, again, need emergent ophthalmology consultation. So this next chart over here, I'll uh, let you guys uh, take a look at, again, at your leisure. This can just help you with your differential um, and can just help uh, you kind of walk through the path of the red eye and making sure, again, to ask some very, very important specific questions. And then the final slide here is eye problems and who do you refer, right? Which patients do you want to make sure you refer? If a patient only has one eye, refer them, right? Because <laughs> they have nothing to fall back on. So, you know, make sure you get, you, you know, if you're sure of your diagnosis or not sure of your diagnosis, you make sure that you document that they are following up with the ophthalmologist or call, call them if you need to. Um, also, if a patient has a laceration of their lid, and especially if it goes through, these patients should be repaired by ophthalmology. The reason being is if that is not perfectly repaired, you know, and then there's some abnormal scar tissue that can cause corneal abrasions and can over time lead to blindness so you really want to make sure that you refer these patients the other thing is just remember also if a patient has an eye complaint make sure it's not something else right if a patient has diplopia or has vision loss you want to make sure that it's not something more central right and if you're sure that it's not and you're sure it's localized to the eye then these patients are uh, great candidates to make sure to refer as well Okay, and I think with that, then I will uh, leave you for your next lecture.